right, so big weekend coming. Um, let, me, let me take, you know, I like to do this. Let me take my quick survey. How many of you have some plans with the family this weekend for our Easter, big Easter weekend? Absolutely. How many of you, part of your plans include being here at Calvary? I know some of you are traveling, but being here at Calvary for that Easter. Ooh, I like that. I like that. All right. How many of you think you're going to be able to make that Good Friday? Lift your hands up on that. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, Easter, so beautiful, so many things to celebrate, and, and really, I think for all of our families, we kind of have this whole series of traditions, particularly built around Christmas and Easter, right? I, I know for a lot of us, Easter is this great time where we get together with family, we have sort of amazing meals, there's kind of these traditions that we do a lot of the time that, that sort of wrap around a church service, they wrap around going shopping and picking out that new Easter outfit, ladies, and coming on in that. Um, Easter eggs and, and dying Easter eggs, we loved that when we were kids, and hunting Easter eggs. Um, I, I know for a lot of you, your kids are a little bit too old, they're getting past the point of wanting to, to hunt Easter eggs. Um, I know a guy who actually, he had, he had all boys and he did this thing where originally, you know, when they were little kids, he'd hide candy, he and his wife, in these plastic eggs like we normally do. But the older the boys got, they started putting money in there. And every year, they'd go up with the money. And so, you know, it started out like coins, and then it was dollars. And then when they got a little older, it was like fives and tens. And so their boys were like in college, and they, they had like $50 bills in these eggs, and they said they would bring their boys home from college, and these guys would just fight tooth and nail like dogs over these Easter eggs. So I'm just giving you some tips. If you have older kids and you want to have your Easter celebration and bring them back, it might not be a bad idea. Um, so the, these Easter celebrations, these Easter traditions, one thing that's interesting about those is oftentimes we kind of take them for granted. They're just something we've done forever. We've done with our family forever. We don't give it a lot of thought. But oftentimes some of the origins of these traditions are absolutely fascinating. A lot of times the origin of these traditions means more than we think. In fact, did you know that Easter originated as a pagan festival. Um, it was really celebrating spring and the vernal equinox and all that. In fact, the term Easter comes from the word Eostre, which was the pagan goddess of spring. But here's the thing. When Christianity came along, instead of just rejecting the pagan holiday, all the people were taking part in it, instead of just rejecting the holiday, they redeemed it. They took it and they gave it a better meaning and a higher meaning and kept the valuable parts and discarded the pagan parts. And so Easter really came to symbolize the resurrection of Jesus. It was teamed up with spring and new life. And, of course, we believe that the Passover season, which took place around March and April. So the church didn't outright reject it. They redeemed it. Same thing with eggs. Originally, um, the egg was linked to pagan traditions that celebrated spring. But Christianity came along and redeemed that practice. And since the 13th century, the egg has been used as a symbol of the resurrection of Jesus. The church would actually teach lessons about the resurrection using eggs. Dying eggs, historically, symbolized the blood of Jesus. Well, how about the new outfits? Some of you are like, ladies, you're like, I don't need an excuse to go buy a new outfit. I don't care about the origins, like it's all good. Well, wearing new outfits originally tied to spring, right? A, a new season, it's getting warmer, all of that. But in 300 AD, the Roman emperor Constantine, who, who claimed to be a Christian, declared his entire court needed to buy the finest new clothing and wear it on Easter Sunday. So a lot of times these traditions, these things we just kind of take for granted. We do it because we've always done it, mean more than we think. And that was certainly the case in our text this morning when Jesus gathered together 12 of his closest followers around the most important holiday on the Jewish calendar. If you have your Bible today, turn to Luke 22 with me. Luke 22 
And if you don't, we're going to get the text here on the screens. Thankfully, we've got screens back today. We'll take it. Luke 22 and verse number 7. How many of you glad you're here today? Say amen. amen. Okay, the Bible says this. Then came the day of unleavened bread. Actually, let's go back a little bit. I want to go back a little further than that. Let's look here. Yeah, let's do it that. Okay, seven. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. Verse 14. And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. Okay? Passover. To say that the feast of Passover, the holiday called Passover, was a big deal to the Jews would be a colossal understatement. This required ceremony was such an important thing, it commemorated Exodus 12. It commemorated when God used Moses to bring the Jewish people out of slavery. And it was such a tremendously big deal that back in the book of Exodus, God had said, from now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. He said, this Passover celebration is such a big deal, I'm going to rewrite your calendar. I want to start the year, Jewish people, with this. This amazing commemoration of 400 years of slavery, but now God was going to bring his people out of Egypt using Moses to do it. So as the disciples gather with Jesus, he says, I want you to go get a place for us. And he told them how they were going to find it. And they meet in this upper room, and they are reclining. It's not the picture you see of the the Last Supper where they're all in like a long table and straight back chairs. That's not how they ate in that day in that part of the world. It was more like reclining on one arm, pillows all around, a small table. It was very intimate, and they're celebrating this Passover feast. Here's the thing, that meal centered around three very symbolic foods. First of all, there were bitter herbs. These herbs were so bitter that some commentators say literally, they would sting your tongue. They would bring tears to your eyes. And the symbolism of these herbs when they ate them and, and the tears ran down their face and it stung their tongue, that was symbolizing the absolute sting of slavery. When you ate that, you were supposed to remember 400 years of, of living under the whip, of living under the chain. Second, there was, first of all, bitter herbs. Second, there was a roasted lamb. The Bible was incredibly specific about how to cook this lamb and how to eat this lamb. And as we're going to find in just a moment, this lamb was the centerpiece of it all. This lamb was going to be incredibly key to them getting freedom and actually getting out. If the the herb symbolized slavery, the lamb symbolized sacrifice. Finally, they were to eat bread made without yeast, Even today, the Jews eat this, and they call it matzah. And and literally, this bread made without yeast, in New Testament times, it came to symbolize more than this. But when they took it in Old Testament times, it symbolized the speed with which God had called them out of Egypt. Here's the thing. We've said this many times from this stage. God, listen, is a God of the suddenlies. A lot of times it seems like he's not doing anything. A lot of times it seems like he's too quiet, like nothing's happening. And then the Bible will tell us, and your experience will tell us sometime that suddenly God shows up and does something. Well, suddenly, they didn't even have time to like let their bread ferment. They had to pack up their bread that they would have cooked the next day and like head out because God had set them free. Every time they ate these herbs on Passover, they remember the slavery. Every time they ate that lamb, they remember the sacrifice. Every time they ate that matzah, they remembered the speed at which God can change everything. The feast was amazing and very meticulous in the way it was to be carried out. Beth Moore, in a beautiful little book that I've picked up called Jesus the One and Only, Beth Moore described the Passover feast like this. Listen. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. 
The Passover was a celebration for families and those closest to them. Well, Christ was surrounded by his closest family. They may have been weak, self-centered, and full of unfounded pride, but they were his. He desired to spend this time with those men. As they gathered around the table at sundown, Christ took the father role in the observance. Soon after they had gathered, he poured the first of four cups of wine and asked everyone to rise from the table. He then lifted his cup toward heaven and recited the Kaddush, or the prayer of sanctification, which would have included these words or something very close. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who created the fruit of the vine. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, who has chosen us for thy service from among the nations. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has kept us in life, who has preserved us and has enabled us to reach this season. If Christ and his disciples followed tradition, they took the first cup of wine, asked the above blessing, observed a ceremonial washing, and then broke the unleavened or the yeast-free bread. These practices were immediately followed by an enactment of Exodus 12, 26 through 27. Now listen, stay with me. The youngest child at the observance would be prompted to ask the traditional Passover questions, provoking the father to tell the story of the Exodus. The youngest child there was supposed to ask something like this, Father, what does all of this mean? And that daddy was supposed to recite, in his own words, the history of the Jewish people, all the way from Genesis through Abraham, all the way from Abraham to Moses, all the way from Moses to the Passover. Early church tradition, Beth Moore says, cited John as the youngest apostle. In all likelihood, John assumed the role of the youngest child in the family, asking the traditional questions that provoke Christ to tell the story of the Passover. Picture John, right? If you've read the Gospel of John or 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, the author of that gorgeous couple of books stands up and he's assuming the role of the child and Jesus is assuming the role of the daddy and he says, Father, what do all these things mean? Listen to this. At this point in the meal, Christ poured the second cup of wine and narrated the story of Israel's exodus in response to the question. Can you imagine Jesus Christ, who had actually been there on the night of the exodus, relaying to his disciples exactly what went on? I won't be able to get close. But Jesus told something like this. Israel had been enslaved by the Egyptians for 400 years. Egypt had come to make their life absolutely miserable till finally the cries out to God had reached such a fever pitch, such a fervor that God had to act on behalf of his people. And so he tells Moses, Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh. I want you to go to the, the basically the king of all the world at that time. I know you have no power in the world's sight, and he has all power, but I want you to go to him, and I want you to tell him that your God is telling him, let my people go. Set my people free. It's enough. 400 years is enough. Let them go. And God, and Moses says, God, I, he'll never believe me. They'll never believe me. There's no way I can do that. How will he know that God really sent me? And God says, Moses, don't worry about that. I'm about to send plagues on Egypt that will be spoken of till the end of time. I'm about to flex my mighty arm in a way that nobody will be able to forget. Pharaoh refuses to let the people go, just like God said he would. And Moses starts bringing, sent by God, 
plague after plague. At first, the Nile turns to blood, and Pharaoh still won't let him go. Then the land is plagued by frogs, and he won't let them go. Then the dust turns into these gnats, these flying, stinging insects, but he won't let them go. Then flies tear through that place, but he still won't let them go. Then the livestock start dying, and the people are getting hungry, and their commerce is suffering terribly, and the people are hoping now, oh, please let him go, and he won't let him go. Then he sends boils on man and beast, but he won't let him go. Then he sends hail coming from the heavens with fire, and he won't let him go. Then he sends locusts that wipe out every living, growing thing and decimate Egypt, but he still won't let him go. Then he sends a darkness so thick, so heavy, so oppressive. And nobody leaves their house for days, but he still won't let them go. And and listen, there was meaning in these plagues because God, in one part of Exodus 12, said, I'm about to show my power on the gods, little g, of Egypt. And, And if you know your Egyptian history at all, you know that they worshiped thousands of different gods. And so listen, When God turned the Nile to blood, it was a direct assault on Hapi, the god of the Nile. When he sent the frogs, it was an assault on Het, the frog god. When he sent the gnats, it was an assault on Geb. When he sent the flies, it was an assault on the lord of the flies. All these gods were being shamed while God is bringing Egypt to its knees. Nine plagues. And he still won't let him go. And so God tells Moses, I'm going to send one final plague on Egypt. And this one will be devastatingly effective. Here's how I want my people to prepare for it. Exodus chapter 12. Look at this with me. Can you put that on the screen for me? Okay, I mean, this may be a different translation if you get it than I'm reading to you. So let me, let me give it to you. Just, just forget about it, and let me do it out of ESV. Okay, is it there now? Okay, let me read it to you. The animal you select must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or a goat with no defects. He said, here's how I want you to prepare. I want all of you to get this animal. I want all of you Jews to get this particular lamb or goat. Make sure it's of the first year, a male with no defects. Make sure it's spotless. Take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day of this first month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb or young goat at twilight. See the next one. They are to take, they were to empty the blood of this lamb into a basin. And these families were to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides and the top of the door frame of the houses where they were to eat the animal. That same night, they must roast the meat over a fire and eat it along with bitter salad greens, bitter herbs, and bread made without yeast. Look at the next part. Do not eat any of the meat raw or boiled in water. Very specific. The whole animal, including the head, legs, internal organs, must be roasted over a fire. Don't leave any of it till the next morning. Burn whatever's not eaten before morning. On that night, God says, I will pass through the land of Egypt. And I will strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. But the blood on your doorposts will serve as a sign, marking the houses where you are staying. 
And he says to his people, when I see the blood, I will pass over the Passover, you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. One more. For the Lord will pass through the land to strike down the Egyptians, but when he sees the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe, the Lord will pass over your home. He will not permit his death angel to enter your house and strike you down. God was very specific. Tonight, tonight, at midnight, I'm going to go through the land of Egypt, and my death angel is going with me. And he is going to ride with a plague of death in his hand. And I'm going to send him into every home. And every firstborn son, man and beast, he's going to strike. But for my people, take this lamb. Be sure. It's a male. Be sure it's spotless. Be sure it's this certain age. And when you sacrifice it, take the blood, and I want you to put it on the door frame. So we have a picture of that. Put it on the sides. Put it on the top. And when I pass by your door, when I pass by your family, when I pass by your home, and your home is the home, when I see the blood, I'm going to have my death angel keep on walking. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Picture Jesus telling his disciples this story, and they are rapt attention. They'd heard this all their lives. Their own daddies had done this for them. They'd probably done it for their kids. But they'd never heard it like this. And I wonder if Jesus didn't describe the night, a night he had seen when whole families, listen, the midnight hour comes and they're there in their homes, huddled around, and they'd eaten that lamb, and they'd roasted the rest of it, and they'd had the bitter herbs, and they'd had that meal. And listen, nobody's sleepy, and nobody's tired, and they're, they're huddled together there, and midnight comes, and the screaming starts. And the Bible describes this as a cry that went out in Egypt There'd never been a cry like that before, and there would never have been again. Listen, Egypt was a nation that's seen a lot of war, a lot of butchery, a lot of bloodshed. There was never a cry like the cry that night. I think hearing that would have been horrific. And don't you know, listen, I wonder if you couldn't hear the presence of God moving down your street. I wonder if you couldn't hear the screams getting closer. And just when the door swelled, just when the wind pushed on it, and you hugged your family tight, I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if some moms and daddies weren't thinking, oh, will the blood be enough? Will the lamb be enough? Or will God strike me too? I don't think anybody got a lot of sleep that night. But when the sunrise came, when the dawn came, when little sleepy-eyed kids woke up and looked around and mama kissed their faces, the blood had been enough. The lamb had been enough. 
That was the story Jesus told them that night. But you remember I said with our tradition, sometimes there's more to the story. And he didn't stop there. I want you to look one more time at our text. Luke chapter number 22 and verse 14. Let's start there. And when the hour came, he reclined at table and his apostles, his disciples, his followers with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. The New Living Translation makes that a little bit plainer. I, I, I've, I've longed to eat this meal with you before I suffer, for I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. What is Jesus saying? He is saying, listen, this tradition you've been doing all your life, this thing your moms and dad is, dads have rehearsed for you, you, you've done it without a second thought. It's been special to you. I'm telling you, there's more meaning to this than you think. Look at verse 17. And he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, he took the matzah, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given, King James says, broken for you. Do this, eat this in remembrance of me. And they're all thinking, I, what? I've never heard that before. That's new. That's not part of the ceremony. This is my body. This bread this is my body. When you eat it, I want you to remember me because I'm going to be broken for you. Verse number not, uh, uh, 20. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. What was Jesus saying? Jesus was saying, listen, this beautiful ceremony all these years, you've thought about the slavery, you've thought about the sacrifice, you've thought about the speed at which God brought you out, but I want to tell you guys something right now, and I want you to get this. I want to share some new meaning with you, and I want to share it with all the world, because this is going to change everything. All of history is going to turn on a dime. Jesus says, I am the Passover lamb. That Passover lamb, all those sacrificed and the blood smeared on those doorposts, that was just a picture. It was just a shadow. It was a type. I want to tell you, listen, that bread wasn't just bread. It's a sign my body's going to be broken for you. That wine wasn't just juice. Listen, it's a type of the blood that I'm going to shed for you. I am the lamb that has to be sacrificed for the world if God is going to bring you in. Here's what he says in a few short hours. We're going to leave this upper room, and they're going to come get me in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Jews are going to pull me out in front of their leaders, and you know what? They're going to inspect me and inspect me and inspect me, but they're going to find that I am a flawless, spotless lamb. And then you know what they're going to do? They are going to take me and turn me over to the Romans the whole congregation of Israel is going to sacrifice me to them. Can you pull up that picture, Keith? And they're going to hang me on a cross. Doesn't it look like a cross? But here's what I want to tell you. What looks like defeat isn't defeat. What looks like the ultimate end of me and all of it isn't really the end. Because listen, when God inspects your life one day, 
when God tries you and measures you to see whether you guys, whether all of you people in the future are worthy of heaven and you know you're going to come up miserably short. Let me just tell you something. When he comes knocking at your door, when he sees the blood, he will pass over you. You know what, it was almost as if that lamb was being struck instead of them. And I want to tell you, listen, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, God, instead of punishing you, punished him. God, instead of striking you, struck him. I remember in my very first church, I had a guy who came to see me one day, and I, I noticed in church he had been, like so many, he'd started out attending very occasionally and kind of sat at the back and kind of got out as quick as he could. And, but you could see through the weeks and through the months, like God was, God was talking to this guy. God was after him. Reminds me of a certain Marine up in that balcony today named Will Maxwell, who started out way back in the balcony, back row. And he started moving up a little bit, moving up a little bit, moving up a little bit. Until God brought him home. This guy one day after, after months and months and months, maybe it was years, came and sat down in my office and and. And we started talking about what Jesus did on the cross and how it can actually bring you back into a relationship with God. We're sinners. We're so messed up. If we stand before God, we can never bear it. Hell falls down on you. But Jesus, when he spread out his arm, he took the blow. And this guy, I'll never forget, he told me, Brian, I, I believe that for other people, but not for me. And he told me, he said, you know, I, I, he told me about this terrible circumstance where he had actually face to face killed a man. And he'd never been able to get over it. He said, I don't believe God could forgive somebody like me. There may be somebody here today you feel the same way. Oh, Brian, if you really knew you really knew what's going on deep inside, if you really knew what I'm thinking about, if you really knew what I'd done that I got by with or maybe I did, if you really knew what was on my computer, if you really knew who I was running around with, if you really, you'd know. There's no way God could save somebody like me. You know what you're really asking? Is the blood enough? Is the lamb enough? I was able to share with this guy, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. And friends, I want to tell you something. Listen, you're not good enough to come back in a relationship with God, and neither am I. And if you think you are, you are sorely mistaken. And I want to promise you, based on this book, not based on the culture, not based on what somebody told you, based on this book, there won't be a living, single living, breathing soul that stands before God one day and actually comes into heaven based on their own goodness. He knows the deep down you. He knows stuff nobody ever seen. And he knows what you would have done if you could have gotten by with it. God knows. But here's the thing. Jesus was so perfect, so spotless. Listen, when he was sacrificed, when he took the blow, listen, God put all his wrath on Jesus till there was no wrath left for you. Praise God. He put all his anger on Jesus till there was no anger left for you. Praise Jesus. Listen, the blood was enough. The lamb was enough. You may question you, but don't question him. 
You may question your goodness, and you should, but don't question his. He is a Savior, and his blood is sufficient to bring you home. The blood is enough. (laughs) I want to close with this. Revelation chapter 5, before we look at it, it records this. One day, all this is over. This human history we, we have been living in, this little dot we occupy on the grand timeline of humanity, one day it's all done. One day God says, I'm going to bring on a new heaven and a new earth, and I'm going to scrub the slate clean. And all the systems that people have given their lives for are going to be erased. And all the possessions that we've been so enamored with aren't going to matter at all. If you want to see the possessions men have fought for and died for, and cheated for. Stop by the junkyard on your way home. If you want to see the glory that men have lifted themselves up to and tried to impress and tried to be popular and tried to look the part and be, stop by the cemetery on your way home. Jesus says, I'm going to eradicate all that. And one day, Jesus is going to reign And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And he describes in the book of Revelation a day when all the angels and all the saints gather around Jesus. And here's the song we're going to sing. Look at this. Then I looked again. And I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of the living beings and the elders, and they sang in a mighty chorus, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Go on. (laughs) And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, they sang blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living beings said amen and the 24 elders fell down and worshiped the Lamb. Friend, listen to me. One day, one day, one day, not the perfect people, not the good people, there aren't any, but we that have been bought with the blood of Christ, one day we're going to gather around that throne and we're going to say, the blood was enough. And worthy is the Lamb.